The first thing I knew that I was going to go to Bletchley was a note saying, go and report at the post office research station at Dollis Hill. We were given little diagrams, often hand-drawn, and told to go away and make that. I, I was doing things, but being an engineer, I'd have a reason for doing things. And I, I couldn't quite make out what I was doing. I was assembling and testing some bits and pieces for what purpose I didn't know. When I went for my interview, the lady at the Foreign Office made it very clear that it was secret work and I signed the Official Secrets Act before actually I, I think before I left her office. I got married during that period and for 15 years my wife never knew what I did. And it was merely put to us that we were going to develop some electronic equipment absolutely new to the industry. Nobody had used electronic equipment to code break. Bletchley Park, as the wartime code-breaking centre, was dealing with an astonishing volume of traffic, thanks to its own brilliant successes at cracking the German Enigma codes. By 1942, Bletchley Park was facing a fresh challenge, in the form of a new code system that the Germans had introduced, called Lawrence. The complexity of the Lawrence code required a whole new response from Bletchley Park, a whole fresh leap in technological thinking, a whole new jump in terms of engineering ingenuity. It would require many more recruits. The analysis of the messages was taking some six to eight weeks to break the wheel settings, and it was being done by hand. So they needed a faster way of doing the statistical analysis, and that task was given to Tommy Flowers. He realised that with the new electronics that he had been exploring, it would be possible to construct a machine that could decode at previously unimaginable speeds. Because they, they changed the coding every midnight. Unless you could decipher in, say, the first two hours, it wasn't much use. We had some code-breaking machines working. We were tasked, first of all, with attempting to improve these machines, in particular the Heath Robinson, which was the favourite one at the time. We really thought that uh, he wanted a complete redesign. It was not satisfactory. Tommy was working on digital switching techniques using valves. All the doubters, they said, oh, you're pushing your luck there. They said, that'll never work because valves they, 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 they're glass, so they're, uh, you know, they, they break. <laughs> but Tommy Flores uh, outvoted them and said, if you keep them working uh, all the time, they're less likely to fail. And he, he, he was right. So Colossus One was born. Each rack would be uh, wired, say, at Dollars Hill, they would then come to Bletchley Park and erect it as units and we would connect them all up. We had a soldering iron. I'd never used a soldering iron before. There was two other girls and me, and I think maybe their fingers were nimble and small and could uh, handle the soldering iron and the wire. It took months and months uh, to build the machine that would become the Colossus, but by 1943, they'd done so. There was great pressure to get the first uh, Colossus built and working, but after that, uh, I think we've produced, I'm not sure whether it's eight or ten. Part of the brilliance of Bletchley Park was that they were reading codes almost as quickly as the recipients. These were messages going all the way right up to the top of German high command. There were Bletchley Park code breakers who, thanks to Colossus, were starting to see messages that were sent by Adolf Hitler himself. In fact, Churchill reckoned that two years was taken off the duration of the war by the breaking of the German High Command Code. We carried on until Edida, until the war was over, and immediately we were told we could go. And of course they broke all the Colossus up. When we had the order to uh, 
dismantle all the equipment. The idea was to smash everything, smash all the valves and everything else. I can well recall feeling a little bit disgusted about it, really. You felt cheated in a way that you'd worked so hard on it and that um, it was going to be no more. That was the idea. Get it out of the way, and it never happened. Some of them were thrown down coal mines. Just the whole piece of equipment was dumped down the disused coal mine and things like that. The war had given way to the Cold War, and there was a great deal that the British didn't want the Russians to know about. Tommy Flowers, he himself had got some various master documents in a safe, you know, concerned with uh, Colossus. And uh, he had been instructed that these were to be destroyed. And he went down to the workshop and destroyed them, put them on the fire. And that was the end of them. It was a great shame. I think we all realised that Tommy Flores and his immediate team hadn't got the uh, recognition of what we'd done during the war. Colossus was the first real, pardon me if I say so, crude <laughs> computer. The logic gates that are used in Colossus, Tommy Flowers and his team developed the circuitry. The functionality of those logic gates are in every computer today. I'm extremely proud that I worked on it. I mean, I think it's good that people know about Colossus. I mean, it changed the world, really, didn't it? We regarded it as a challenge, really. If they wanted something, we were the people to do it. And we were. I think that I was exceedingly fortunate to survive the war. And the war gave me a, a, the foundations of a career that lasted the rest of my life. I can, I can, I can almost remember it now, you know, it was that many years ago. What, 50, 60, 70 years ago.